Tonight on a special edition of In Focus, we're examining the path out of the pandemic and taking your questions to Senator Mike Braun and our U.S. representatives from the 2nd District, Jackie Wilarski, 3rd District, Jim Banks, from the 4th District, Jim Baird, 5th District, Victoria Sparks, from the 6th District, Greg Pence, 7th District, Andre Carson, 8th District, Larry Bouchon, and 9th District, Trey Hollingsworth. And it all starts now on a special In Focus Town Hall. Well, good evening and welcome to our In Focus Path Out of the Pandemic Town Hall. I'm Dan Spieler. I'm Beer Shalad May. Thank you to the Hoosier State for joining us as we broadcast live in 91 counties. And I'm Bob Donaldson. Tonight, we've gathered members of the Indiana Congressional Delegation to talk about what we've learned from the pandemic and the path out for Hoosiers as we move forward. We have Senator Mike Braun and many of your House representatives joining us virtually to answer your questions. We want to take a moment now and thank our lawmakers for joining us this evening. Well, a couple of big developments in pandemic relief today. First, starting on Monday, vaccine eligibility will open statewide for Hoosier educators and support staff. That includes teachers and staff in pre-K through high school and child care centers. Bus drivers, counselors, custodians and food service employees are also included. It's a big step for a state that's only focused on age and health conditions as eligibility factors so far. Earlier this afternoon, the House voted to approve the latest stimulus plan 220 to 211 in an almost straight party split. Here's a breakdown of how the Indiana delegation voted on the final version of the American Rescue Plan Act. Only representatives Andre Carson and Frank Mervin voted yes. All other representatives and Senators Mike Braun and Todd Young voted no. Senator Young declined the invitation to be part of this town hall. The president plans to sign that bill on Friday. We do have many of our other representatives with us tonight and Senator Mike Braun. Senator, you voted on this bill this past weekend, voting no, that party line vote really entirely along party lines in the Senate and in the House. What kind of specific changes would have been needed to get your vote, Senator Braun? Well, it was touted as a uh, COVID relief bill uh, aimed at public health concerns and Anyone that looks into what came over from the House um, and basically uh, passed in the Senate uh, with a few adjustments had maybe 10% to do with actual vaccinations and public health related to COVID. It was so wide ranging. Uh, and that's why I was glad Senator Ron Johnson at least required it to be read. Imagine taking 10 and a half, 11 hours to read a bill. That tells you how expansive it was. And to me, uh, there were 10 Republican senators that went over to the White House uh, a few weeks before and wanted to target it in a way that would have covered stimulus checks, probably aiming it at ones that uh, still do not have a job, uh, maybe a little uh, lower income threshold. Price Biggest tag you would have found acceptable? What's that? Is there a price tag you would have found acceptable? Um, that was offered at 618 billion, so that was one third of it, and okay. if that would have uh, been stretching it in terms of what was directly aimed at public health, vaccinations, uh, just shoring up okay. the distribution of them, all of that. Okay. But stimulus checks, uh, unemployment, enhanced benefits. Most Hoosier employers I talk to are having trouble getting people back to work. Okay. Don't want enhanced benefits stretched out all the way to September. Okay, I want to turn next to Congressman Andre Carson. You voted for this bill in the House. What's your response to what Senator Braun said there? And were there any specific aspects of the bill where you think Democrats should have or could have compromised more? Well, thank you for having me. You know, I'm, I'm extremely thankful that we have passed the American Rescue Plan. Uh, this was a collaborative effort between the Biden administration, Congress, and a variety of stakeholders, quite frankly. You know, last November, a record number of Americans voted for change and much needed relief. I'm pleased that we have made good on that promise. The bill is not perfect. No bill is perfect. But it's the boldest effort yet to address the public health and economic devastation this pandemic has caused. This $1.9 trillion plan is going to help us defeat the virus, get more Americans vaccinated, get kids back to school, 
and keep those already back in school much safer, provide much needed stimulus payments to middle class Americans, help small businesses and so much more. So, you know, the, the plan is broadly supported by a large majority of Americans, which makes it strongly bipartisan in my opinion. So if we want to fully recover from this pandemic, we have to act boldly, and that's what this bill does. All right, on the other side of the aisle, we want to bring in Congressman Larry Bouchon because he voted against this stimulus plan after voting yes to the other two plans last year. What's different about this one, and what changes could have been made to get your support? Well, the first thing you have to remember is there's about a trillion dollars from the legislation we passed last year that hasn't been spent, including about a third of the money that we sent to the states. And the other thing is there's been no oversight of the legislation that we passed last year. So how do we know what's needed going forward? Look, as Senator Braun said, there's some things I think we broadly support, including uh, some level of stimulus payments, obviously the stuff going into the public health system. But my, my big issue is, for example, California had reported a $10 billion surplus in their tax revenue. And based on uh, the unemployment rate, they may get 30 or $40 billion that is gonna come partially from the people that I represent, the tax dollars. So we, we didn't properly uh, look at how things went last year, why we had a trillion dollars outstanding, still unspent, and we didn't uh, properly uh, vet the, which states need, uh, need money. And there's a, a laundry list of other things in there. You know, this, For example, the city of San Francisco is getting 92% of their budget deficit paid off by the American taxpayer. Um, and I wonder why that is, because okay. the speaker's from San Francisco. So the list is long of the reasons. There are common ground, there's common right. ground in there, and I think we could have found it. But uh, there wasn't really an effort uh, from the other side to uh, try to make co find common ground. All right, Congressman, thanks. Michelle? We do want to note that how our representatives and Senator Braun voted on the two stimulus plans in 2020. So as you see here, everyone voted yes on the first plan. Representative Jim Banks switched his vote during the second plan, as did Representative Trey Hollingsworth. All Indiana's lawmakers voted yes on the CARES Act, the first stimulus plan. Congresswoman Victoria Sparks only voted on the third package. That's because she is one of the newest members of the Indiana delegation. Congresswoman Sparks, Hoosiers voted you in at a time when the U.S. cases were surging. Americans wanted another relief package. You voted no on this third package. Why? And would you have voted yes on those first two stimulus plans? Well, you have to take one thing at a time, but I can tell you because I do read the bills, so I've read through this bill, and we need to call a spade a spade. <laughs> Only, you know, more than 90% of this bill has nothing to do with COVID relief. So I do like some provision of this bill, and I wish my Democrat colleagues would have a discussion and debate. You know, Congressman Banks, is, so he's you know, with me on Education Labor Committee. We spent over 13 hours trying to debate and offer some common sense amendment that makes sense, and they all were rejected. So unfortunately, our budget project process is broken. We use a reconciliation process, which never was meant to be used for budgeting, and it's not dealing with this issue. It's, it's bandages for underlying problems that we like pension pay plans bailout. They've been, you know, a problem for a long time without actually providing solutions. So we cannot continue doing it at the expense of our children and middle class. I think it's not policy making. It's a lot of politics, and I just don't believe it's good. And just to follow up here on that second portion of the question, so while you don't support certain measures here in what passed, what about the first two? Would you have supported either of those? Well, I didn't look as much in the details. I think they're all good provisions, but it seems to me, you know, uh, that since it did get bipartisan support, contrary to this bill, it's something that we needed at that time. And But we still didn't spend all of the money from previous bailouts. We didn't even look what's happening there, right? We didn't even see the relief where it went and what we really still need to target. We didn't reassess it and need to rush suddenly within a few weeks after the last, last relief to any new one. So I don't want to make a comments without reading through the whole scope of other bills, but it seems to me it was more acceptable and had really bipartisan support. We'll hear more from the Congresswoman in just a moment, but now we want to bring in our partners at Wayne 15 in Fort Wayne with a question for Representative Jim Banks. Dirk Rally from Wayne 15 News. Representative Banks, polling suggests the American people, including a majority of Republicans, favor the personal stimulus checks. Now, we know you oppose bailouts to blue states and other pork projects, but what items would be included in the perfect Jim Banks stimulus package? 
Well, thank you, Derek, for that question. Uh, the fact of the matter is this bill that just passed the House today on the way to President Biden's desk on Friday is the first bill during this pandemic related to COVID relief that doesn't have a single Republican vote in favor of it. It's the first partisan COVID relief, so-called COVID relief bill that has passed through the process. You heard Congresswoman Sparks talk about the reconciliation process. Democrats use this legislative trick to pass a bill without a single Republican in the House or the Senate voting for it. At a time when we should have had a bipartisan opportunity to come together and look at ways that we could continue to support programs that we know work, like the Paycheck Protection Program. Dirk, I heard from hundreds, literally hundreds of businesses in Northeast Indiana that told me that the PPP program kept their business alive through this pandemic. The perfect bill on, that I would support would be one that focuses on support for small businesses. Um, stimulus checks are certainly something that we, we should provide for those families who need it. Uh, means tested for those who meet it, need it, who have been affected by the, by the pandemic. But I got to tell you, Dirk, we are now, the bill that passed today, when the president signs it, we're going to tip the scales over $30 trillion in national debt. Um, we've, this will be $5.5 trillion in, in uh, spending that we've, we've, uh, that we've passed through this Congress um, during the pandemic. We have, a, we have a moral responsibility as leaders to think about future generations, and it's going to be my kids, my three daughters, 11, 9, and 7. Their generation is going to pay the price for not just the spending in this pandemic, but for the fiscal irresponsibility in Washington for a long time. We have to keep that in mind throughout all this, uh, all, through, through all of this uh, process as well. We'll get back to Congressman Banks in a moment, but now the next question is for Congressman Trey Hollingsworth and Greg Pence. We want to focus now on the direct short-term and long-term impact that the stimulus plan could have for businesses. Congressman Hollingsworth, let's start with you now. The rescue plan now headed to President Biden's desk. We just heard the uh, other representative talk about that happening on Friday. You did not vote for this measure, but how could this relief funding help businesses in your district? Well, I do believe there's much work to be done in getting Hoosiers and Americans back to work, getting Hoosier and American students back in the classroom and ensuring that we finally put an end to this pandemic. The problem is, as many of my colleagues have said, much of this bill did not do that. Much of this bill was misdirected spending towards states that have been fiscally irresponsible, towards pet projects. I want to see us get through this pandemic and recover our strong, robust economy we had prior to it. This bill will help that. Certainly, much of the spending wasn't directly related to that. But I do think we are going to see, especially as vaccinations go up, as cases fall, increased economic growth over the next six to 12 months, which I'm excited about, so that we can get more Americans, more Hoosiers back to work. Let's get a similar question now to Representative Greg Pence. You're a business owner yourself. And now that it's passed, what expectation do you have from this stimulus plan? Is it enough for Hoosier business owners? Well, I think that this COVID-19 bill that just got passed today was really, it missed the mark. It should be about Main Street, not Wall Street. You know, this bill today has $135 million for the National Endowment of the Arts, $135 million uh, for National Endowment of the Humanities. This is a bailout of Chicago. We've got small businesses, restaurants, hotels throughout Indiana and in my district that are suffering. We had a trillion dollars yet spent, had unspent. Uh, that needs to get out where it needs to help small businesses in the district and helping out Chicago and other big cities. San Francisco, as was stated, is just the wrong focus for this money. This is going to be $6 trillion in 12 months, $17,000 per person will be sent out. And the formula going forward for this bill is going to hurt Indiana and help big cities, New York, uh, Illinois, and California. And so, Congressman, let me follow up here on some of the numbers that you're discussing now, because obviously there's concern. Well, when you're talking about more, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've got $6 trillion now that's been uh, approved. I, the first two bills 
were unspent. We had plenty of PPP dollars left and PPE. I like some of the modifications that we did uh, for businesses that suffered more than 25% over a given period. So it's not about what more should have been spent or added. I think we had enough and I think we moved a little too fast. But remember, the Democrats called this a progressive bill this week, okay? A giant progressive bill. It's a giant bailout of big cities and pension funds. I will right, we'll hear more from Congressman Pence later in this program. We know that the impact on businesses often depends on the type of industry. Bringing in representatives Jackie Wilarski and Jim Baird into our conversation, you both represent different Indiana industries, starting with you, Congressman Wilarski. The South Bend area you represent obviously has a lot of manufacturing. What's the reaction there to this type of assistance? Well, I, I'm grateful that when this happened, that uh, the governor deemed manufacturing as essential workers. And so obviously in my district where, you know, we lead the nation in producing RVs, boats, trailers, hardwood furniture, and those kinds of things, I think you've all seen, we've all seen, you know, our economy in Northern Indiana hasn't just bounced back, but manufacturing is in record sale mode. And still, as we cross into this, you know, new season, and this new year, they are still producing at record rate. And so, you know, I would say that our district's doing great. You know, our kids are back in school. Our folks are back to work. And the one thing that this bill is disastrous in is, you know, we're in a labor sh shortage in Northern Indiana. We need people to come to work. And so when people in my district, job earners, job creators heard about this bill, they record called me and basically said, don't pay our people to stay home. We're in a labor shortage. We need people to come to work. And I will tell you this, that, you know, um, Elkhart County has done a phenomenal job as well. And the reason we're having these record rates and sales is because the local elected official did a great job of making sure that this was a healthy workforce to go back into a healthy facility to work in. Congressman Jim Baird, you represent parts of Western Indiana, including Lafayette, Greencastle. What are you hearing from, from voters and residents in your district? Well, you know, it, it, what Jackie had to say about getting back to the work is extremely important uh, in that district. And uh, agriculture, uh, this pandemic made us all realize uh, how disruptions in our food supply chain are uh, uh, very impactful. And uh, so it's important uh, that we recognize supporting farmers and supporting agriculture. And then, as was mentioned, uh, manufacturing is 29% of our GDP in this area. So uh, when, you, when you take into account on that day, almost a year ago, uh, when some of our restaurants and um, tourism facilities were closed down because of the pandemic, that's pretty abrupt. And, and I was really proud that we were part of a, a fast paced, getting the PPP out, uh, getting those funds in the hands of those people that needed it. And also the CFAP program, which a lot of people may not understand, but that's the coronavirus food assistance program. And a part of that goes to the farmers, but an, also a part of that is the families um, uh, to um, people who need food. And so it lets the USDA purchase specialty crops and purchase milk products, uh, produce or purchase uh, meat and we put them in box and we distribute them through our uh, distribution channels into those folks that need them and so early on when we saw milk being dumped on the ground especially crops in florida being uh, plowed under uh, and uh, euthanization of some of our animal products uh, it was important to make sure we get or had the opportunity to help those people uh, get their feet back on the ground and survive this pandemic okay. and so all of those uh, programs that we've had up to now uh, have been pretty well targeted and as some of my colleagues mentioned uh, we still had a um, the money left over from our previous legislation right. and now we're going to add another two trillion to it okay. and so i'm concerned when you when we don't target uh, and have um, influence on where these funds are going. All right, Congressman, thanks. Uh, recently, I, I also had the chance to speak with Transportation Secretary and former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. I asked him about the size of this stimulus bill and the debate over doing 
too much or too little in this latest round of stimulus? We're in a crisis of historic proportions, and I think there's much more danger in doing too little than there is in doing too much. And there are a lot of things that maybe it's not quite obvious, uh, unless you think about it for a second, how they're related to COVID, but they are. I'll give you a simple example, and it's from my own area of tra transportation. Uh, we got a lot of support in here for local transit agencies uh, that are absolutely vital, especially for frontline workers who depend on them to get to work. Senator Braun, I want to bring you back into the conversation here. What's your response to that? Is there a risk in doing too little right now? So I think you've got to measure that by looking where we were pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, uh, we had the hottest economy that I am uh, was a part of. Uh, before I became a senator, I had a business for 37 years. And that uh, those policies put into place in December of 17, uh, the Jobs Act and tax cut bill, unbelievable. And when you look at how states were run and the climates across the country, I want to go back to what someone mentioned earlier. Eight out of 10 of the states that benefited disproportionately from the bill were Democrat states. California, New Jersey, and New York led the way. So measuring that difficulty in terms of COVID, which did throw us for a loop, uh, was different across the country. And I think when you look at it, maybe as Nancy Pelosi is looking at it, Chuck Schumer and uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, they're trying to defend places that may not have had the business climate, do not use uh, rainy day funds, uh, do not have balanced budgets, uh, don't run their affairs like you do in Indiana. So in Indiana, we're nearly back to full employment, but places like Illinois, California, New Jersey, that had hard shutdowns early, lifted them late, probably had some of the issues from the way they managed COVID. I did a couple floor speeches in March, said the trickiest part of this is going to be how do you navigate through the peculiarity of the disease? It looked like it was going to be different. Respect it. Don't, and businesses, by and large, did that thoroughly. And then how do you keep the economic patient healthy? Pete Buttigieg, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi obviously measured it wrong. Now want to do this huge spending package to throw things back okay. in balance, mostly in places that didn't manage it right in the first place. I want to get back to Congressman Carson here as well. Concerns about the size of this bill aren't coming entirely from Republicans. You had former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who also said it was too big. Are you concerned at all about the price tag? Well, I'm always concerned about the price tag, but I think that it's more important. We have to ask ourselves, uh, are we there to be merely representatives, or are we there to be uh, trustees and stewards over taxpayer dollars? And of course, mm -hmm. uh, both are true. Now, having said that, I think because of the criticality of the times, we are required to do what's necessary to, one, get us out of this devastating pandemic and get our economy back on track. I've spoken to Mayor Pete, uh, and he understands that ridership has plummeted by nearly 79% in 2020 alone. Uh, as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so we work to allot $30 billion for transit agencies across our country to prevent and prepare and respond to the continued threat of the pandemic. Um, my district happens to have the largest Amtrak maintenance facility in the country. Uh, we were able to have $1.5 billion to keep Amtrak fully operational through the end of 2021. Uh, which will end effectively worker furloughs and restoring full services. So uh, I think it's important that we have our arteries restored and we may, we're making sure that um, our economy is back on track. This pandemic is unprecedented, it's historical. So we have to do unprecedented things and remarkable things to get America back on track. We can have the economic discussion and fiscal discussion at another time, but our constituents Black, white, rich or poor, Democratic, Republican, independent, non-theist, want us to make use of their taxpayer dollars in an effective way. That's why they send us to D.C. every two years. 
Congressman, you just mentioned unprecedented items and just movement that you had to make while on Capitol Hill. We want to continue with you and also bring in Congressman Pence. Originally, the minimum wage increase was part of the stimulus plan. If history repeats itself, there will not be enough votes for this increase. And given that, should $15 an hour remain a Democratic legislative agenda and why? Yeah, you know, I was very disappointed uh, to see the minimum wage provision removed from the American Rescue Plan in the Senate. Uh, this was done not by members of Congress who opposed it, but by the Senate parliamentarian who claimed it should not be included in the bill. However, we're not giving up on this priority. We haven't raised the minimum wage in over a decade, quite frankly, yet cost of living has increased. And it has created a situation where more and more hardworking Americans and Hoosiers just can't make ends meet uh, through no fault of their own. And the economic fallout from the pandemic further revealed how many Americans are just one missed paycheck away from financial ruin. You know, raising the minimum wage can help change that and basically grow our economy, which we have seen in other states that have increased their minimum wages. Representative Pence, you've just heard what Representative Carson has had to say. You also voted no to $15 an hour back in 2019. And again this year, if minimum wage were to increase, what is the number you and fellow Republicans could support? Well, let me, my thought about Indiana is uh, we've done such a great job. We have some, such great jobs here in Indiana. Maybe $15 an hour works in New York City, uh, but you can have a good life in Indiana, many of our fan manufacturing jobs are paying 15, 16, 17, 18. When we talk about the minimum wage, we're talking about entry level. I can tell you that down in my district, very few pay people are getting paid in the $7 range. In fact, I don't know of any that are getting paid that low. It's 10 or $11. I think this is an arbitrary lift, uh, try to help unions. I don't think it's helpful at all. Uh, I think where we're at, let the market drive. We have a, a, a labor shortage, as Jackie mentioned earlier. That will draw the wages up in our district. We need more people to work. We don't need to, to send. If we raise $15 an hour in Indiana, we're going to send jobs back to and more jobs to Mexico and China. And Congressman, you know, you just mentioned there aren't many perhaps in your district or very much employees that are facing $7.25 an hour, which is what we're seeing here as minimum wage. But it's 32 million Americans across our nation who do have that as their wage every week. That's the paycheck they're taking home. So again, what number in particular would you maybe support for those 32 million Americans to see an increase? So I'd actually dispute that number. You're, you're telling me there are people, 32 million uh, people in America, which is over 10% or at 10%, are actually making less than $300 a week. I don't really buy that figure. Uh, the market in Indiana isn't at that, and I have to focus on what the people of the Indiana 6th District and Hoosiers are doing, and I think we're well above that. And that number I would really challenge. <laughs> And thank you. We want to go to a viewer comment now. Joe from Carmel asks if faith could be restored in congressional leadership after the partisan battles during the impeachment trial and the COVID-19 relief debates. With Joe's question in mind, we want to bring everyone in for the final question of this segment. You're all on camera right now. With a show of hands, how many of you agree that all of the tensions in Washington make it more difficult for Congress to come together on very important issues. A show of hands now. Almost unanimous there. And those are some of the issues that won't be going away. Next on our special In Focus Path Out of the Pandemic, the mask mandates. We'll find out which lawmakers support them going forward and who wants them to end.